and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you. Big, big show today. Uh, we've got some big bomber news right off the top to get to. A huge milestone in the NBA last night to uh, talk about as well. And then a, quite a bit of hockey talk and a little bit of Super Bowl as well. Greg Wyshynski from ESPN is going to jump on. Uh, lots to get to around the National Hockey League as we now get into the post-All-Star game portion of the schedule in a race to game number 82. Murat Atesh of The Athletic will join us. Interested to get Murat's take on some of the latest names we've heard thrown around in trade rumors around the uh, National Hockey League, as well as a look ahead to the Jets as they get back on the ice with that late game, 9 p.m. on Saturday against the Chicago Blackhawks. And, Probably a little combo hockey and football segment to finish it up later on. Our guy Zig Fricassi, who uh, kind of double does double duty with Sirius XM NHL radio and NFL radio. Obviously, I want to talk to him about the Super Bowl as well. But we will get Zig's thoughts on uh, the landscape of the NHL going down the home stretch and getting closer to the trade deadline as well. Should be a great show. Welcome to everyone that's listening on the podcast. If you are a podcast listener, make sure to check out our YouTube channel and the video portion of the program. And make sure you hit that red subscribe button when you do it. Um, and of course, to everyone on YouTube right now, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. If you haven't already, hit that red subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to the episode. And make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you get your favorite pods if you're unable to join us on YouTube for any particular show. Just before we get Remus in here, got to thank the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Led off by Princess Auto, Cool Vet Canada, Little Brown Jug, Canadian Club, Culligan Water, Vita Health, Fresh Market, Wallace & Wallace, Consolidated Supply, F Apparel, Manitoba Battery, the Nick & Nicky DQ Group, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, and uh, we'll get to a why not question of the day in a minute. I think it might be poll time in the chat today on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Let's get Remus in here. Remo, what's up? How are you? Hey, I'm feeling good, Hus. We're just counting down until this Jets Jets game, 9 p.m. Uh, Saturday. But we will they'll be on the uh, practice ice tomorrow afternoon. But, hey, we did have a great uh, great day yesterday after the show. Um, Jeff Hamilton breaking the news about Kenny Lawler. Coming to Winnipeg, Kenny then saying his goodbye to Edmonton on his Instagram. And then we had uh, LeBron James, who was the star of last night. So I had some stuff to occupy occupy myself, and I'm you know, always you know counting down the trade deadline, too. Also had the report shovel day off in San Jose, taking it, or sorry, in Tampa, watching uh, the Sharks. So. I don't know. It's scout watch season. Uh, scout watch. It is definitely scout watch season, executive watch season. And uh, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of scuttlebutt as to who is where watching what over the course of the next few weeks. And we'll get to that with Wyshynski. But let's talk about that huge news that was broken by our guy, Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press yesterday after we went off the air. Kenny Lawler coming back to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I'll be honest, Reem. I didn't get my hopes up for this. Because I just didn't think it was doable. But Kyle Walters did it again. Kenny Lawler is back. Now, of course, he had that $300,000 contract, highest paid non-QB in the league last year with the Edmonton Elks. He's not going back to Edmonton. He's coming back to the peg where he was a part of those back-to-back Grey Cup championship teams. Farhan is reporting that it is a two-year deal that pays him between two hundred sixty and two sixty five in 2023 and 300K in 2024. He took less in year one to accommodate the Bombers and obviously wanted to be back in Winnipeg where he has had his greatest success along with the greatest team success. 
after coming to the Canadian Football League. Um, listen, we'll talk about what that means for some of the other guys like Greg Ellingson and Rashid Bailey in a minute, but man, what a coup for the Bombers to uh, get right into it and get the number one receiver on the board in addition to all the elite veterans that have already been maintained and re-signed with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Just huge news for the Blue and Gold. Yeah, this this was massive, and uh, we posted on our social media ton of re- ton of response. And actually, I posted the story yesterday. Justin Dunk reporting that they were interested in bringing back Kenny Lawler, and we had already heard that. That wasn't really news because we know they tried to get him uh, before the trade deadline. But I kind of was. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. But how are they going to make this work salary wise? And worked some magic, and and here he is um, committing and. Um, I saw Darren Cameron, the PR, the PR for the Bombers, said he had a FaceTime with Kenny Lawler, saying that Winnipeg was where he felt comfortable, where he wanted to be. And look, sometimes you take the money because you feel like you have to, but money isn't everything. Doesn't you know? Maybe you're not happy with the location. You don't like. Uh, you're not comfortable with the new players. Um, you know, obviously had a connection with Zach Caleros, and you know, last year the quarterback situation at Edmonton. Um, well, they didn't have the MOP. I'll, I'll say that. So. Um, I think Kenny Lawler for the Bombers offense has to give them this, you know, your top three receivers and and shown who was the best, you know, the best in the league last year. Oh. And uh, Dembski, you know, you can do it all. And another deep threat in Lawler. I mean, good luck stopping these guys. Like, that's, that's an incredible, this is like fa- building a fantasy team here with these three. Well, I mean, it's pretty clear what the Bombers are doing right now. They're loading up and doing everything they can to get back on top of the mountain and win three championships in four years after falling just short in last year's uh, Grey Cup. And, you know, I have been paying attention over on CoolBet to the CFL Futures and was wondering whether that news of Kenny Lawler coming back to Winnipeg would change things at all. And to be honest, it hasn't yet. I have a feeling that might happen at some point. I mean, the Bombers are still clearly the favorite going into next season at plus 215, BC 5-1, to one, and the Toronto Argonauts plus 550. Uh, but I kind of have a feeling that when the dust settles, that number might get down even lower, potentially below 2-1, to one because... Um, the Bombers have been the standard in the Canadian Football League for the last three seasons. Obviously, we know what happened in the Grey Cup game, so anything can happen. Um, but I think we can make an argument that this team looks even better right now before going through all of free agency with the guys that have come back and a huge, huge addition of arguably the number one receiver in the Canadian Football League who was such a big player. And to your point about him going to Edmonton, I, nobody begrudged Kenny Lawler for taking the bag last year. I mean, these careers are incredibly short. Your earning potential needs to be maximized. Um, but it is interesting that the Bombers were able to find a medium of a number that worked for Kenny Lawler. Of course, he might be taking a little bit less in base salary, but I think he can pretty much count on a nice playoff bonus and fingers crossed, maybe another Grey Cup championship bonus um, for playing in the playoffs. And, to your point, I mean, he's had his greatest success here, a great connection with Zach Caleros, and I think when he and everyone around the league looks at a great spot to play for this upcoming season, despite losing in last year's Grey Cup, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are still the team to beat, and uh, Kenny Lawler's coming back to uh, try and run it back and uh, get to the top of the mountain once again with the Winnipeg uh, Winnipeg Football Club. Yeah, I got uh, some of his numbers here, Huss, last year, he only played 12 games. He did have a collarbone injury, 58 catches, 894 yards, five touchdowns, 15.4 yards per catch. And that, you know, deep threat. I think they were definitely missing him at times. He was on the Grey Cup winning team. And, um, you know, having him back, absolutely huge. Now, but now that he's back, what's going to happen to the rest of the roster? Farhan was speculating, you know, Greg Ellingson, he's probably moving on. I'm, I'm not sure where, maybe... To go to Montreal to you know fill in for Jake Weineke, although they're they're not really op- making any negotiations as because their ownership is a mess, and we'll get to that at some point later. Uh, Rashid yeah. Bailey, what ha- what happens with him? But also there was speculation from Jeff and Farhan that uh, Michael Couture, offensive lineman, is going to go home to BC. So we'll have to see what happens with the roster. But for now, Kenny Lawler is the guy, and uh, I mean this offense is going to be pretty scary uh, with the with this group of receivers. Also, you know finally. Can't forget uh, Drew Waltarski and Carl. A lot of people talk about Carlton Agadosi. He had that one game 
last year where he had how many touchdown catches was it was two or three i mean it was i think it was a couple it was two but he was like the vertical on that guy just jumping up over defenders and grabbing the ball was salivating uh watching him last year so yeah, yeah. and he of course got injured shortly after that and missed mm-hmm. most of the rest of the season but he is also a weapon that i think would be a great compliment um, to that stud starting three. And I know there's some people in chat talking about Dalton Schoen. Um, I really think that if he was going to sign in the National Football League, it would have happened already. Um, we haven't really heard about him working out for clubs. And again, he had been there beforehand. I think most of these teams knew. It was uh, When we talked to uh, Kyle Walters a few weeks back, and Bomber fans, definitely check that out if you missed it. It was fascinating on how kind of things work in the offseason, what the team's doing, especially as it pertains to guys going from the CFL back to the NFL. This was a very different situation than Nathan Rourke, despite the incredible season that Dalton Schoen had. And I think what that means is that the guy that was the most productive receiver in the Canadian Football League will likely be back with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And then you add in Kenny Lawler and Nick Dembski. And uh, man, certainly offensively, you know, with Brady Oliveira back, with the line back, with Zach Caleros back, um, No surprise that the Blue Bombers are the favorite right now. As far as Couture goes, I mean, it's unfortunate to lose a guy like that, who um, Jeff's reporting that he's most likely going to the BC Lions. Um, But the play of Chris Kolonkowski was, um, you know, I think allows them to move a little bit more of that money to a couple more big-time playmakers and no bigger one on the market than Kenny Lawler. So um, huge news for the Bombers as we get closer to the official start of free agency, you know, this contract can't officially be signed until next Tuesday on Valentine's Day, the 14th, when CFL free agency gets going. Um, and now we will wait. I mean, you mentioned Greg Ellingson. You know, he had injuries issue, uh, injury issues last year. Had some great chemistry with Zach Caleros when he was in the lineup. But I don't think he'll be back. And the one guy I'm already seeing uh, seeing comments in chat that I think Bomber fans are disappointed to lose if he does go elsewhere is Rashid Bailey. But with the with bringing back Lawler, with re-signing Dembski, assuming that Dalton Schoen is back, Wolitarski in the mix, Carlton Agadoski signed, I'm not sure there's a lot of room, and I certainly don't think there's a lot of cash for Rashid. Um, but I will say this, I'll miss him, I'll miss his energy, certainly miss talking to him on Winnipeg Sports Talk because he has been uh, a huge part of this team over the last few years, And um, but he deserves the opportunity to make what he can right now while he's playing his career out and, and probably play in a much more significant role maybe on another team in the Canadian Football League. So that'll be a guy I think we'll pay attention to going into free agency, but if you're a big Rashid Bailey fan, I hate to say it, but it might be the end of his time here in Winnipeg. Yeah, and, and I thought Rashid Bailey was going to take a big step forward. He got off to a slow start, uh, but he ended up having a solid season. Has nine touchdowns, uh, and what do you have? 63 catches, 729 uh, yards. Uh, really good blocking as well. So you can definitely contribute for a team, but with signing Lawler, I don't know how you make Rashid Bailey fit as much as you know, he's been on the show. We're huge, huge fans of the guy. Always wears his heart on his sleeve. So we'll have to see what happens with Rashid. You'd love to see him back, but you also want him to be able to, you know, get get what he can us while he's still still playing. So we'll have to. That's something we'll uh, wait and see. Um. So anyway, so we'll uh, let you know if there's any more breaking CFL news over the course of today. But that'll be a big focus early next week, coming out of Super Bowl Sunday with CFL free agency getting going on next week and obviously some clarity about the Dalton Schoen situation. But I think as far as that goes, no news is good news when it comes to Dalton Schoen as uh, he's signed for next year with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And, um, you know, there's, what, another week to sign with the NFL. Otherwise, he's back with the blue and gold. And, man, that is... uh, (laughs) To think that we could be going, or we likely will be going into the season with Dembski back, Kenny Lawler back in blue and gold, and Dalton Schoen, um, about as good as a position you could be in heading into uh, heading into this bet. Um, We'll get to uh, we'll get to LeBron in a minute, um, uh, Reem, um, as well as some of the other NHL news because uh, Greg Wyshynski is coming up in just a second. I think Greg's in a bit early, so we'll get right to him just before we do that. Uh, when we uh, begin our dive into a lot of hockey talk, talking trade deadline and everything coming out of the All-Star game with the uh, game back on the ice, 
Don't forget, folks, if you have battery needs right now, it's going to get cold about minus 20 tomorrow night. Otherwise, pretty nice, at least for the next little while. But we're not out of the woods yet with this Winnipeg winter. If you have battery needs, Manitoba Battery, Donnie and his great staff are there for you. If you're thinking you might need a test to see whether this battery is going to get you through into the summer, pop by 1026 Logan Avenue for a simple and easy, quick battery test. And if you need one, you'll be able to get your battery at the best possible price, shopping local at Manitoba Battery. But if you do know you need one, they're going to save you money and save you time because they'll deliver it to you anywhere citywide if you get your order in by 3 p.m., same day delivery. Um, give them a phone call, Manitoba Battery, or check them out and order online at manitobabattery.com. Your local battery experts over on Logan Avenue. Uh, we are looking ahead to getting this snow out, maybe some playoff hockey in Winnipeg, the snow melting. And if you're thinking about projects for the upcoming summer when it comes to grass, irrigation, artificial turf, Consolidated Supply is there for you. They've got everything you need. That's why they're leaders in the golf course industry. And not to mention your club car dealer, if you're thinking about tricking out a golf cart, maybe to use either on the course or at the cabin so far the next, next season. They've got that for you. And again, thinking about bigger plans for the backyard, talk to Spicy Joe and the gang about a new hot tub or some of their amazing outdoor kitchen options as well. Consolidated Supply, 1395 Niaqua Road East or online at cte.ca. Don't forget, we're still taking nominations for the Unsung Hero program along with Wallace and Wallace and Jets All-Star defenseman Josh Morrissey. Send us your email to unsunghero at winnipegsportstalk.com. Let us know that person in your life or in your community that's spending important hours, time, and effort helping those in the community, whether it be through extensive charity work, whether it be through volunteering in a myriad of sports and minor sports programs or within the education system, or maybe it's just that person on the block that's doing the shoveling for some seniors and helping everyone out when they need it. Send us those emails, unsunghero at winnipegsportstalk.com. We'll have an autographed Josh Morrissey jersey for the unsung hero for the month and uh, wallace and wallace is going to donate 500 dollars to the dream factory and josh and margo morrissey are going to match that as well so everyone's a winner with the unsung hero program with their friends at wallace and wallace and just before we bring in wish uh don't forget folks that right now is uh the time to head down to uh, vita health fresh market because it is heart month and uh, they've got all sorts of natural organic supplements, beauty products, groceries and things to help you get that ticker as healthy as as possible. Um, of course, they are also going to be supporting a great local company that's been around for eight, 65 years. At Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives, seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. And don't forget, if you're still battling colds and sore throats, check out that Cold Flex Oregano Spray made locally by Inatech Nutrition. All right, back from the ASG, the ice is, uh, well, popping right now. We've actually had some good games the last couple of days coming out of the All-Star break and always fun to catch up with ESPN's Greg Wyshynski. Wish what's going on. You have any fun down in South Florida? <laughs> you got a, a nice sunburn that's peeling right now. It's so my nose looks as red as it does. Uh, you know, usually it'll look redder, you know, later in the day when I'm, you know, writing. Got to have a little bit of that liquid, uh, liquid word lubricant occasionally. But for this, for the purposes of this, uh, it is red because of the sunburn. And we got a time. I mean, it was, it was, it was, a, um, it was an interesting event. Uh, fun might be pushing it in some aspects that I think could be improved for subsequent All-Star games. But, um, but it was a really good time to uh, see everybody. And for the most part, I think uh, the All-Star experience was a good one. I mean, I, I think more highlights than lowlights, at least from where I was sitting. Yeah, and I think it's very different if you're in the market there because I oh, mean, yeah. it is a great convention of the biggest stars in the National Hockey League. Everyone seems to be having fun. I mean, I think we all agree that the television product has a little bit of a ways to go. But honestly, it comes down to one. The crux of the matter is sometimes the guys aren't particularly motivated to be giving it their all. And I don't know how you get past that, Greg. I mean, we've changed the games. We've changed the format. We've now had the three-on-three -three the last couple of years. 
I mean, even in the skills competition, we had some guys sort of pull out. Connor McDavid doesn't want to be in the fastest skater, which sucks for fans. I mean, is there an obvious solution to this in your mind, or is this just part of having a game, much like the NFL deals with trying to make the Pro Bowl relevant, when you have such a tough physical game, very tough to expect the best out of your players in what amounts to an exhibition? Well, I think the NBA is a good example of, of at least from a skills competition perspective, what the NHL should do, which is um, work with these guys a little bit more on, in particular, their trick shots. You know, the, the NHL, I was at the dunk tank event on the beach, which I thought was awesome, by the way. Like, if you told me 10 years ago that uh, we'd get Sidney Crosby in a dunk tank on the beach at the All-Star game, but I said you were insane. But yet, lo and behold, there we were. Um the, the people who tested that event were the trick shot artists that you see on YouTube. And they have huge followings and um, they were bought in to kind of like test the skills beforehand, make sure that the, 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 the dunk tank thing worked. Have those guys partner up with the players to develop shots and develop, you know, tricks to do with the skills competition. Like allowing David Pasternak free reign to create an incomprehensible homage to Happy Gilmore does no one any good having David Pasternak work with Nasher or some of these guys that are on YouTube whose uh, trick shots have gone viral. Well, well, now you've got something. So that's one fix. The other fix for the actual all-star game. And by the way, for the record, the first three on three game stunk. The second one was incredible because he had Sid and Ovi carrying. You had the Kachucks carrying. It was really, really good. It was like everything you'd want from an all-star game. And then the third one was all right. Um, my idea has always been million dollars split 12 ways. If you include the coach, meh, whatever. If the winning team, those 11 guys don't have to pay escrow for that season <laughs> for real, like now you've got something now you've got all these guys, can, all these guys that have to stand there with a bottle of sports drink in their hands and they've got a million dollars in their pocket. A million dollars is not a big deal. These guys. But not having to pay escrow, well, that's a big deal. And if you made that the carrot for the All-Star game, I bet you'd get some effort. Um, you know, one thing, that's a great idea. I don't know how that would go over in uh, the commissioner's office, but uh, certainly it would be worth bringing up. Not, hey, look, he doesn't care. Like, it, it's, the, it's the NHLPA that's going to worry about how to calculate the escrow. So it's all on them. If they're for it, let's go. <laughs> a great idea. Um one of the other things that it is so it's such a stark contrast between the NBA and the NHL is how much of an honor it seems and how important it is for players in the NBA to be considered all stars and to be there. And um, you know, it is unfortunate, I think, that with the format where you have to pick a player from every team, even though in the end the Seattle Kraken weren't represented because they couldn't get anyone to fill in for Matty Beneers, um, if they selected all of the best players some that weren't there to make it. I think that adds a little bit more to the game. But I, the more and more I think about this, and Sean Shapiro and I were talking about this the other uh, uh, earlier this week, if you made the skills competitions of every team where the fastest skater and the hardest shot, the two more established skills competitions that people do get into, if every team sent a player for the hardest shot, and a player for the fastest skater. You could make a bigger event, get a, a lot more out of it, and I think at the same time you'd kill two birds with one stone in the fact that every team would be represented on the weekend, and then you'd be able to focus on truly having the best all-stars playing in the game on uh, the following day. What do you think about that? I think there's something to be said for it because the, the skills competition inherently is not only supposed to impress us with the abilities of the best hockey players in the world, but it also establishes a connection between fans and, and these players in what they're really good at. Like when I think of Ray Bork, not only do I think of one of the best defensemen of all time, but I think about him hitting them little targets faster than anyone could. When I think of Zdeno Chara, I think of the height, I think of the cup, I think of the, the nastiness, but I also think of him shooting the puck really, really hard, you know, and, and Dylan Larkin's a great example. Like Dylan Larkin, is a very, very good hockey player. But I think for a lot of us, we know him as the guy who won the fastest skater and like beat Connor, right? So like 
the skills competition inherently should be a place where you develop new stars by virtue of here's what they're really good at. Um, that being said, I vehemently disagree with the notion of not having every team represented in the All-Star game. I understand that it's a way to get more stars in the game. You want to highlight the stars. I still go back to when I was a kid and, and, and in the 1980s, and the Devils sucked, and they were never making the playoffs. And what a thrill it was for me to see Kirk Muller or John McClain skating on the same line as like Mary Lemieux. You know, like when you're a kid, and, and this game should be for the kids, your first rooting interest is your team. It's not necessarily to be a fan of a player. It's it's through your team. And so to be a Jets fan and to see Josh Morrissey in the All-Star game, or, you know, to be a Vegas fan and getting a chance to even have Chandler Stevens in the All-Star game, like those entry points to me are still very, very important insofar as how do we embiggen the tent to bring more interest to this, this to this annual event and uh i'm 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 for the, the the representation i know it's tough with 32 teams but it's something i would really uh, hate to see go away yeah as you i mean it's a great point as you get bigger i mean it is more challenging and um, yeah, i mean it, it is you know there's uh there's pros and cons to it all um before we get to some trade scuttlebutt and everything happening around i have to ask you about the uh the successor to donald fear um this yeah. sort of came out of the blue do i think well, certainly myself i mean tell us about the new head of the NHLPA and how this came to be. I mean, this was not a guy I had not heard of him before in any hockey circles, uh, right. kind of an interesting path to a very important gig when it comes to the NHL and its uh, players. Yeah. The process started last April with the NHLPA putting together a search committee of, of seven players. That search committee eventually enlisted what's basically a professional recruitment uh, organization to help them out in the process. And, you know, you, you started to hear some names bandied about. You heard uh, Mike Gillis, the former GM of the Vancouver Canucks. You heard Matthew Schneider, who was Donald Fear's right-hand man with the PA. You heard uh, Agent Alan Walsh, which for my purposes would have been the greatest hire because there would never be a dull day <laughs> in NHL PA land. Um, but then they, handled, they, they settled on another Walsh. They settled on Marty Walsh, who was the U.S. Secretary, or, uh, Secretary of Labor under uh, President Biden. Uh, hilariously was the designated survivor during the State of the Union address last night, which means that if, God forbid, anything happened to the rest of the people in the administration, he would have become president, which is a, a heck of a, of a going away gift, I guess, before you leave for the NHLPA. But, um, but Marty Walsh used to be uh, a big uh, labor guy in Massachusetts. Uh, he was then the mayor of Boston, um, obviously worked on labor under uh, President Biden. And so those are his bona fides there. Also a Boston Bruins season ticket holder, also a really big hockey fan. So as, as uh, one, one insider put it to me yesterday, he's kind of the unicorn they were looking for. They didn't want somebody, the players that is, that had baggage with Gary Bettman, that had baggage in previous labor negotiations. They wanted kind of a fresh start and a fresh set of eyes to approach these issues. But they also wanted a hockey guy. And so in Marty Walsh, in theory... You get both. You get a guy who understands the game, who's not going to have the same learning curve as Don Fear. And Don Fear is a brilliant, brilliant guy on the labor side, but had, a, let's just say, a, a hill to climb when it came to his knowledge of the game. Um, you don't, you're not going to have that with Marty Walsh. But what you also get in Marty Walsh is an interesting conflict of interest. As, as many people may have, have seen, uh, the Jacobs family, owners of the Boston Bruins, Jeremy Jacobs, head of the NHL Board of Governors, uh, very heavy uh, uh, in the donations to Walsh during his mayoral campaigns in Boston. In fact, the uh, 13 grand Jacobs family gave him at one point um, was the biggest uh, a political donation that family had ever made. Um, he's got ties with them. He's got ties with some others in, involved with NHL ownership. And so like that could be a good thing at the end of the day. The guy is a politician. The more people you know, the more glad handing you've done that could help with these with these negotiations ultimately. Or, you know, I think it probably came to, uh, uh, as a surprise to at least some in the rank and file in the NHLPA that, oh, the guy that we hired to run our union is also a guy who took money from Jeremy Jacobs, which is not uh, on, on, on the surface what you want to hear if you're a player. No, it's an, I mean, you know, the minute you start mixing politics into this, I mean, it takes a whole nother um, turn, if you will. I mean, there's other things yeah. that can be added in, as you uh, as you just pointed out. As far as but the that, gig- but, but if I could if I could pause on that for a second, that's what makes this hiring even more interesting. Like this is a politician, 
you know, he's not a lawyer. It's, he doesn't have a law background. He's got a labor background, but not a law background. And so the, the two things you have to do if you're the executive director of the National Hockey League Players Association is you have to be able to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement. And I'm sure he'll build an impressive team of lawyers to help him do that. And then you also have to bring everybody together as a united front to fight for the things that you want, whether it's the Olympics, whether if they ever grew a, a, a backbone and, and really took on the salary cap. Um, you got to be able to do that. I think as a politician, he's probably really good at the latter and maybe needs some help on the former. Greg Wyshynski of ESPN with us talking about all the big stories in and around the National Hockey League coming out of the All-Star break. Of course, we're waiting for the Jets to get back on the ice with that 9 p.m. home game on oh. Saturday night against the Blackhawks. Yeah, that'll be the most buzzed crowd of the year in Winnipeg. I can guarantee <laughs> you that with extra three hours to pregame before they drop the puck. There you go. Um, uh, but, Greg, you, you guys do have a, a great piece up on um, um, uh, ESPN.com on uh, the contenders right now for the awards at the end of the season. And listen, I know there's a lot of, um, it was interesting at the end, you know, we were we spent a lot of time talking about Josh Morrissey, who is known as Norrissey around here for the season that he's having so far. He didn't make that final list of finalists, but one of the comments was at the end, the Winnipeg Jets need to do a better job of getting his name out there. And Certainly around here, and I think north of the border, people pretty familiar with the incredible season that Josh is having. But for folks that might not understand how this works, um, how much lobbying do the teams need to do for players? And how much more does a small market team in Winnipeg that's maybe not getting the exposure that a lot of the bigger teams do need to do for a player like Josh or Connor Hellebuck, who certainly, in my opinion, should be in the mix, at least, for the Vesna? And I think he will be like, I, I think for a lot of folks, and again, it's not the writers who write for the, who vote for the Vezina, it's the general managers, but you think of Olmark, you think of Sorokin and then and out in the West, you think of Hellebuck right now. So I, I, I assume he'll be one of the three, but you know, you never know. Um, it helps. It really does. You know, the, the thing that separates our NHL awards watch, which we do every month, you can find it at ESPN.com right now from other people's awards list is that we survey the actual voters. Like we get their ballots where they stand. It's a different mix each month. We get a good sense of where the winds are blowing for where, where these awards could, could end up. And, you know, there's a little bit of variation here and there, but for the most part, the leader for the Norris for the last couple of cycles has been Eric Carlson and rightfully so he's going to put together one of the best offensive seasons for a defenseman in the history of the national hockey league. Like you have to go all the way back to like, I think the way it stands right now is that if he finishes with the points per game average he has, um, it'll be, the I think, the 10th greatest offensive season for, for a defenseman. And the only players ahead of him on that list are Bobby Orr and Paul Coffey. Like, that is the rarefied air we're talking about for his season. But, as has been the issue in the past for Eric Carlson, it's a, it's a one-sided campaign. Like, he his defensive game probably isn't as good as it was back in the day when people would make that argument against him. There is some room to have somebody sneak in there as the complete package player, which is why I think Rasmus Dahlin and Adam Fox um, and Kale McCarr are all kind of in the mix too. The problem with Morrissey, as has been pointed out now in a couple of different months by the voters, is they just don't know enough about him. They don't know enough about his case. And to answer your question, it is important, and I'll give you an example why. The Nashville Predators when Roman Yossi started to get buzz as being a Norris candidate, aggressively started to not like wine and dine the writers, it ain't the Oscars, but letting us know about the season he had. They would send out releases on him. They sent out like a fact sheet about Roman Yossi around the time when the voting happened. And I got to tell you, like, I don't think it's a surprise that more people were caught up to speed on what he offered as a candidate um, around a very important time of the voting. And it all had to do with just promotion and education. And it, if the Jets were ever to go down that road, I think it would seriously help his candidacy because obviously he's been fantastic this season and one of the top scorers in the league amongst defensemen. The one other guy representing the Winnipeg Jets that's in a mix in the mix for a postseason award is uh, Rick Bonus. And I went off a little bit earlier on, and this, I think, was an NHL.com piece they were interviewing, and he wasn't even in the top six, like midway through the season. It seemed crazy for the job that he's done. It was nice to see him second behind Jim Montgomery in Boston. 
And in a normal year, I think Bones might be the favorite with everything that he's done. It's just that this season, the Boston Bruins are having is just on such another level that, um, you know, he deservedly, I guess, is at the top of the list. What needs to happen for anyone other than Jim Montgomery, whether it's Rick Bonus <laughs> or not, to be in that mix in these final 30-odd games with the Bruins? Or is it almost a done deal because of what they've done to this point? Yeah, I mean, I think it's as close to a done deal as you can get, unfortunately, unless the Bruins really fall off after the All-Star break. Um, I, I can't imagine Montgomery not winning it. You need three things to win the Jack Adams. And again, as a reminder, the broadcasters are the ones who vote for this award. You need to be able to show uh, a, a remarkable improvement in the standings. And obviously the Bruins have that, the Jets have that, the Devils have that, a few others have that. You need to be able to point to specific things <clears throat> that these coaches have done to make their teams better. And in Montgomery's case, the Bruins players sing his praises as being a different voice than Bruce Cassidy, bringing accountability, bringing a sense of fun and joy back to the team. His defensive system has obviously turned Linus Allmark into a Vezina caliber goaltender. Bones walked in and stripped the captain of the captaincy. I mean, like, you could point and say, hey, this guy has done some stuff since getting that gig. And oh, by the way, also his his system helped unleash the offensive game of Josh Morrissey as well. And so he's done tangible things too. And the third factor, because these are broadcasters we're talking about and not, you know, ink drenched uh, writers who are, you know, take their craft seriously. Broadcasting obviously is a lot of, uh, of personality. They got to be, they got to be likable. It's one of the reasons Babcock never won. So I think people like Bones and I think people like Montgomery. I think people like Lindy Ruff, and that's part of the reason why those three might be in the mix at the end. But as far as like the other things go, I think I think Rick Bonus definitely has um, a, a real strong case. But again, the other problem for him is that while he's in the top three amongst our voters, you still have Pete DeBoer to talk about. You still have Dave Haxtall to talk about with the Kraken. Um, you still have Rod Brindamore who's in the mix every year. You still have a lot of other guys. They could maybe also throw their hat in the ring. Well, no, it's a great point. And I mean, full disclosure, I may be sitting on a Rick Bonus, Jack Adams future. So I'm always especially <laughs> interested in this. But I will say this, Lish, you know, if it did come down and it is very tight, and this is something we've talked about it, Rick Bonus being one of the most likable guys in this in this league and being around for over 2,600 games, I think, honestly, if it was very, very tight, that is a guy that gets the benefit of the doubt from the broadcasters more often than not. The question is, can the gap be closed right now because of the otherworldly performance of the Boston Bruins up until this right. point? And I'll throw in one more thing about Bones in there, too. I mean, like, it's it's kind of an underdog story, right? Like, his time in Dallas ended. People were thinking, okay, his next gig's probably going to be as, as, as an assistant coach somewhere. Like, his head coaching days are done. He gets a job in Winnipeg after all the flirtation with Barry Trotz. So he's seen as a consolation prize. And what does he do? He turns him into a, a contender for the Central Division title. Like, I mean, he's got a great narrative, too. So it's a very crowded field. I, I, I would assume if the Jets are still where they are in the standings that he's going to be in the top three. But, yeah, coming overcoming a guy who right now – has his team on pace to set new records and wins and points in the regular season is going to be a very tough hill uh, to climb. Well, I've used this analogy a couple times on the program, but I'll hit you with it. I mean, it's like, you know, when you consider what a mess the Jets were within that team, the dressing room, everything yeah. around it, it was like Rick Bonus went into a building burning, a building burning, a burning building, excuse me, I'll say that three times. Um, saved everybody in the building, put out the fire, minimized all the fire damage, while Jim Montgomery went into a beautiful mansion and rearranged a few things. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was the, the degree of difficulty on the job is very different. But um, listen, you can't, you can't say anything about uh, what the Bruins have done so far this season. Um, moving on to this stretch run to the trade deadline. Um, we've talked a lot about Timo Meyer here in Winnipeg. I'm sure you following the Devils and the Rangers have been around. I mean, is he clearly the number one guy on the board in your opinion? And how many teams and how big of a, a haul might the San Jose Sharks get for uh, get for Meyer? I mean, if your team is thinking about getting him, how big of a push do you need to make to get this guy to, to your team? I mean, his lack of trade protection, I think, really does open the market to everyone in a way that it doesn't for a lot of the other players that are available. Um, the fact that he's he's young, he's a he's a dynamic scoring winger. 
Um, you're going to have teams that have holes in their lineup that are going to be looking for that. I mean, the Rangers are a good example. You know, for the entirety of the season, it seemed like they were keeping a seat warm for Patrick Kane, but who even knows where that'll go um, as far as Kane and his availability, his injury, all the questions surrounding that. Um, and then there's the fact that, that you know, the extending Meyer beyond this year is also going to be on the table for for teams that look to acquire him as well. The Devils just seem like a perfect fit for a number of reasons. I mean, they've got Keisher and Stiegthaler there, two Swiss guys, probably have relationships with them based on national team play and things like that. You have um, the need for another scoring winger, specifically to play with Jack Hughes. I mean, Jesper Bratt and Nico Heischer have developed a really good chemistry. They move Bratt around the lineup a little bit, but they could use another player, a player of that caliber on the wing to fill out their top six. And then his size. I mean, the problem with the Devils right now as a, as a legitimate playoff contender is that their style and their overall physicality speaks really well to regular season success, but we simply don't know what they are in the postseason. It's one of the reasons why they were kicking the tires on Matthew Kachuk last year before it became apparent he, only, he was only going to go to, to sunny Florida, was they could use a little bit more grit and size and grind in their game. And Meyer is obviously a big-bodied player that could really help to that end too. So I think, I mean, the Devils' interest in, in him is, is well-documented, and the fit is really ideal, especially given what he could be owed on his qualifying offer uh, and how much cap space the Devils have through being so young and, and giving out really smart contracts to guys like Jack Hughes. Like they could, they could afford him and they could fit him. And they obviously have the the assets to send back the other way to San Jose, the pick, probably a first, and then you know prospects as well. That the Devils are are in perfect position to make this acquisition if they think that he can fit on that team. How uh, and you know it's interesting. I mean, Winnipeg's another team that's in a great spot cap wise. I mean, they have been uh, acquiring cap space throughout the year, and con- conceivably, even if you're not able to sign him to a long term deal swallow the $10 million qualifying offer, retain his rights for next season and play him or potentially move him elsewhere in the National Hockey League. Um, but considering what we saw the Islanders give up for Bo Horvat, how close will the return be for Meyer? Or is in San Jose in such a good position because of everything that you've laid out that teams are going to have to give the Bo Horvat package and considerably more in your mind? No, I think it's going to be around there. You know, a, a lottery protected first, uh, a, a roster player, and then and then a a, a, a good prospect. I mean, in the, in the Islanders' case, one of their top five prospects, maybe even top three, goes back uh, to the uh, to the the Canucks for for Horvat. I think it's going to be in that neighborhood, and um, it's just going to be a matter of who wants to ante up. And it's also going to matter too. Like one of the things that I think people didn't recognize about the Horvat trade and the Horvat Derby was um, the Canucks had other options, but sometimes you want a specific team is pick. And in the case of the Islanders, like even with it being lot of lottery protected this season, um, you're kind of fading them a little bit <laughs> to yeah. that, that like, that like, you know, you'll get that other pick and then it'll be bad because you look at that roster and it's a bunch of 28 to 34 year olds uh, outside of Matt Barzell. And, and like, maybe they're not going to be good and maybe you're going to have a pretty decent pick. So the, the, the team giving you that pick, I think is also a really big factor in it as well. Well, yeah, what was it, top 12 protected? So, I mean, and if you look at where the Islanders are right now, and I know they've won their first two games with Horvat coming out of the break, um, they've got a long ways to go in a very tough Eastern Conference even to make the playoffs. And if they don't make it, they'll probably be one of those bubble teams that is most likely picking 14, 15, right in that sweet spot for Vancouver in a loaded draft that we've heard from everyone following the scouting game is one of the best we've seen in, uh, in recent history. Jacob Chikrin's another guy that gets a lot of buzz, uh, but this is not the first time. We've been talking about him being traded for well over a year. Why has it taken so long, Greg, for the Arizona Coyotes to move Jacob Chikrin? And should we expect him to be on the move, or is the price just simply so high that no one has been willing to pay it as of yet? Someone will pay it. <laughs> he's, a, he's a terrific defenseman. He's a really terrific defenseman, and I think someone will pay it. But but to, to, you answered your own question. The price is high. And um, the Coyotes um, and Bill Armstrong, their general manager, know that they have an asset that is desirable to a number of teams, teams that need defensemen, teams that are just looking to add to their already uh, rich collection of defensemen like Boston. Um, they know what they have in them. And, and there is no urgency to move 
off that price because they know that that his um his stock is still high and and they don't have to move them they are obviously in a long-term rebuild um and so they're going to wait to get what they're looking for for him and they know that somebody out there will 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 then do it at some point you know greg there's a couple players that don't have contracts for next year that i don't think we expect to be traded but many people are expecting them to be extended Dylan Larkin in uh, Detroit. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in what that Horvat deal, the extension that he signed does to the negotiations with Steve Eiserman. And then there's Pasta in, in Boston, who's having another otherworldly season, can very well be a finalist for the Hart Trophy. Um, they really grinded him on that last deal. He's about to get paid. He certainly deserves it. Um, will it be difficult to get this done? Do you expect it to happen before he flirts with potentially going to the market? Um, I don't think it'll be difficult to get it done. I think it'll get done soon on Pasternak. And I think part of the intrigue is how many years he goes, because I mean, I think there is a certain amount of curiosity from him, uh, about the post Bergeron post David Krejci years in that organization. I think that's one of the reasons why it would have been interesting to see them acquire somebody like Horvat. So he'd have a better sense of who's going to be there playing in the middle along with like Charlie Coyle and a bunch of question marks after Bergeron and Krejci leave. So I think that's part of it. And, I, and I'll be intrigued to see what the ultimate number on term is. Um, but then as far as the money, I, they'll get there with him. I mean, I think he, it's clear that he is one of the true elite players in this league on the wing. I'm not worried about him getting his from the Bruins. Uh, Larkin's an interesting one. Like Larkin, I, I got a chance to talk to him at the All-Star game. And like he clearly does not like the game being played right now insofar as like details of his contract negotiations getting into the press. You know, he said that there have been some like misleading numbers being put out there by somebody. Um, he's not really enjoying himself right now. But I think the counter argument his camp is making the Red Wings is a really important one and an, an effective one, which is, okay, so if not Larkin, then who? Because the, the Red Wings have not had the good draft lottery luck to be able to have a young franchise level center that can move into where Larkin's spot is like Larkin's the best center in the organization, like full stop. And so if not him, where do you turn? Where are you going to find somebody his age that you can bring in to be as effective as he's been. And, you know, even if they're going to try to squeeze him on money, I think that counter argument is a really, really effective one insofar as like what plan B could be. Cause I don't think there is one. Oh, and they've been working so hard to get back to respectability over these last few years. I mean, you do take a big, big step back if all of a sudden he's not there, even if you've got some extra money. Wish, uh, thanks so much for the time. Always great having you on. Keep your eye on Josh Morrissey. We're going to pump the tires for God. By the way, the two of you guys, I don't know who wore that pink suit better um, in South Florida. Yours was pretty dapper. Josh looked pretty good. Two of the fashion plates of the entire festivities down there. The Jets defenseman and uh, you doing your thing with our buddy Arda. Yeah, yeah. I wore a pink suit on our show, The Drop, on Saturday. I think the difference might be in cost as mine was 30 bucks on Amazon with <laughs> specific instructions not to put it in the dryer, probably because it would catch on fire. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure that his was probably, like, tailored. So there's a few, a few differences between him and I. Hey, you wore it very well and uh, really enjoyed all the fun you guys had down. It was great coverage. Keep it up and uh, let's do this again maybe before the end of the season. Thanks as always for your time. Anytime. Thanks for having me. All right on. There's Greg Wyshynski. You can uh, follow him on Twitter at Wyshynski and of course check out his work. Emily Kaplan's got a pretty interesting uh, piece up at uh, ESPN right now as well on uh, some of the latest buzz around the league, including a topic we just hit on Pasternak and Larkin's future in Boston and Detroit, respectively. Um, we're going to focus in more on the Winnipeg Jets in a moment with our good friend Murata Tesh. Before we do that, uh, you might want to wait for your New Jersey uh, if you're thinking about getting one until the end of the trade deadline. Probably be a little more clear who is going to be around for a while and uh, maybe some players that might not be. That being said, when you're thinking jerseys or Jets merchandise, Royal Sports has you covered. Thousands of pieces of Jets merchandise, including many exclusives, tons of bomber gear. If you want to get that Kenny Waller jersey coming up after the big announcement yesterday that he's coming back to Winnipeg. Uh, when it comes to bombers, Jets, NFL, 
We'll have Super Bowl championship material for one team coming up in a week or so. You know who I'm hoping it's going to be. Um, Royal Sports is the spot. And listen, if you're talking about getting out onto the ice, whether you're a casual river skater or an elite hockey player, Royal Sports has you covered top to bottom with the best selection in town. Great prices and a huge stick selection and great deals daily. Follow them on Instagram as well, Royal Sports Pemina, for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And you can pop by seven days a week and get those great deals and the massive selection at 750 Pemina Highway. We were just talking about that pink suit that Josh Morrissey wore. Um, you want to get a sweet custom suit? You know where to go. Fellas down at F Apparel at 190 Smith Street downtown. The leaders in custom suits for men. I know many of those great fits you see the Jets wearing walking into the building are from F Apparel. Um, but whatever you're looking for, they can handle it. Very simple measurement process. Pick out your favorite patterns, colors, and a couple of weeks later, you've got a great custom suits. The custom suits start at $400. They've also got custom shirts, both tucked and untucked, golf pants, chinos, and more. If you're in a wedding party, talk to them about a great special when you, the wedding party gets their suits from F Apparel and another great one for 2023 grads where any 2023 grad getting a new suit for their big day coming up in June will receive a free custom shirt and tie valued at 150 bucks. F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown. Make an appointment or find out more at F. That's EPHapparel.com. Couple games tonight in the National Hockey League. We'll have to wait till Saturday for the Jets to get back. But uh, if you're looking to get together with the gang to watch the big game on a big screen with big sound, Boston Pizza, Pizza is that place to be. Your local BP is waiting for you with ice cold schooners, delicious Boston's wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. If you can't make it out, you can always order online at bostonpizza.com. All right, let's get back to a little Jets talk right now and welcome in Murat Atesh of The Athletic. Murat, what's going on? How are you? I'm keeping well, Huss. I'm keeping <clears throat> well. Uh, well, what do you got on tap? What's going on? How are things? What's going on right now is, um, well, I mean, it's nice to have hockey back, although this Jets break seems like it is forever. I mean, that game against the St. Louis Blues with Morrissey's heroics in the third period seems like it was weeks ago. I guess it was about a week and a half ago. Um, and obviously, I'm quite preoccupied by a big football game on Sunday as well as the Chiefs and Eagles get ready to go. But it has been interesting. I and mean, we've talked a little bit about the All-Star festivities. And certainly, it looked like Connor Hellebuck and uh, Josh Morrissey really enjoyed themselves. Um, and listen, we can talk, and we did a little bit with Wish about, you know, what's good about the All-Star game. What can they improve? I am very interested in, though, the effect the mental effect of being there, feeling like you belong on a player like Josh Morris, who's having this breakout season, to be there, to be lauded amongst the best defensemen in the National Hockey League, um, and Connor getting to go back. I mean, originally, I'm like, no, oh, give the guy a rest, but it seemed like he really wanted to be there and be a part of it. And, um, you know, I'm interested in your perspective on what that might be able to do for those players as they come back to the club with 30 big games to go before uh, hopefully a nice long playoff run. It's difficult to put that in a tangible fashion and say, well, hey, um, that recognition or being surrounded by peers who I'm sure both players look up to, you know, I, you know, is worth this many more points or this many more goals, assists, saves, et cetera. But at the same time, I think all of us in any of our fields have sort of this mental check of, okay, well, what is our peer group? How, where do we belong? You know, am I in, in line with so-and-so from, from this department? Uh, you know, am I an up and comer? What's, what is my future hold? All sorts of different things. And for a guy like Josh Morrissey, who has never been to this game before, I believe that, you know, inside him somewhere there, there's probably a place that says, well, Hey, you know, these are the who's who of the NHL and to be here, to be welcomed, to be, you know, have the kind of weekend that he did. You'd have to think that that's something for you to, to just to associate your name with that group, to to go from being an outsider to an insider in this elite, elite group of players. I mean, I think it does something if your company now you are your own company. But if you phone up Remus one day and, and you, you tell him that he's the best producer that you have. I do it, it every day. Something. Every day, right? Like, um, I, I think that does. I think you can take something forward from that. And, and we've seen Jets like 
you know, Blake Wheeler or what have you finally get that recognition with his huge season and things like that, it can be tough to get that spotlight from Winnipeg and so power to them. Yeah, no doubt about it. And it's interesting, you know, one of the other things we talked about with Wyshynski is how, you know, more and more people are sort of learning about Josh Morrissey, but it does take a little bit of time. And I think his coming out party, being a part of that is, um, listen, great for when we're talking about a potential Norris nomination or anything like that. But bottom line, the one thing that has stood up about, about Morrissey has, that's grown throughout the season is just the confidence level that he's playing with and what that's allowed him to do. And I certainly think that'll be a, a nice positive coming out of this break and obviously their dalliance down at the All-Star game. The other huge topic right now is the upcoming trade deadline and um, really interesting piece that you've done with a colleague in San Jose about Timo Meyer. He's the apple of the eye of not just Winnipeg Jet fans, but probably about half the league right now. And, you know, I'm interested. I, Greg didn't go with me on, on this. I, I was thinking because of how many players or how many teams are in on Meyer or would love to have him, that we might see a real arms race when it comes to, I mean, it, San Jose Sharks are in a great position with a player like that without any trade protection. Um, Tell us a little bit about your conversations with the folks in San Jose, a possible fit in Winnipeg, but what that cost might be to get a player like that and beat out a number of other suitors from around the league in both conferences. Yeah, it's interesting with Timo Meyer that he has the status as the front runner of the, the absolute biggest name. You know, maybe he's becoming a household name because of his season and the fact that he's such trade bait right now. But this season that he's having... He, it's basically him and then what you might look after him. You know, Ryan O'Reilly could theoretically be moved. Jonathan Taze's name makes it out. There are, there are others, but Meyer's impact at his age, being essentially a point-per-game player who drives play in a possession sort of standpoint, just completely controls what part of the ice the game gets played in. He's good off the rush. He has speed. He has forechecking presence. He has physicality. He gets his scoring chances from great areas of the ice. I mean, this is ideal in terms of, of a player for any team. Every team would like to have somebody like that. But also when you look at Winnipeg and you consider Kyle Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, Cole Perfetti, Blake Wheeler in that top six, who's getting to that net front right now? I mean, in that same sort of way, Timo Meyer would be a unique winger on the Winnipeg Jets. So that's something that I like for Winnipeg. I think the fit is really good stylistically. You have him as a former teammate of Nikolai Ehlers and Junior. If you want to do due diligence, start your phone calls there. You could talk to Dylan DeMello or Brendan Dillon, who played with him in San Jose. You know the Jets do this. They talked about doing it with Sam Gagne this summer. They go through that sort of, um, of that uh, due diligence. I guess I'll reuse the word. And that's they have direct lines in, in that sort of way. On the ice, it fits. Off the ice, it fits. And this is something Corey... I actually don't know how to say Corey's last name. Masisek? Masisek? I, I, on it, as a Marat attest, Masisek. Thank you, Remo. Like, I should be good at other people's names if I'm going to ask for Marat Atesh. Um, <laughs> all to say, we, we went together on this piece, and he's plugged into the Timo Meyer situation there, why he might be expendable. We know he's a $6 million cap hit right now. Well, hey, guess what? Winnipeg can, you know, is one of a few contending teams who can fit that into the cap situation. Zoom out a little bit. We know that the sticky point is Meyer has a 10 million qualifying offer owed to him this summer to extend him for one more season before he's also could be a free agent in 2024, just like, say, Pierre Luc Dubois 2024. But 10 million is a number that most teams can't work with. So a lot of teams around the NHL are looking at Timo Meyer as either a one-year rental this year, and then they're walk him to unrestricted free agency, simply not qualifying him is an option for some teams. Another situation is maybe they, you know, teams are able to extend him long-term. And Timo Meyer's personal wishes, his feelings on Winnipeg, I don't know that, but long-term is another issue close to that 10 million figure. Winnipeg is in a unique position where the dollars work. If Pierre-Luc Dubois is not a Winnipeg Jet starting this summer or moving forward, that 10 million figure is actually workable for the Winnipeg Jets. If you look at what they have committed to the cap now and fill out their roster with 750K, 800K contracts like the Jets' current depth players all make. So there are some reasons to think on the ice, 
playing style, cap hit now, cap hit into the future, insulation against the possibility of Pierre-Luc Dubois or other free agents leaving, um, where if Winnipeg can acquire this player, it could be a bit of a home run and a window extender for the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, you know, the, the cap the cap conversation has to be included in any of these possible deals, both short term and beyond this season. And, and I'm with you. And I think where the jets are right now, I mean, that is something they could stomach. Although what is interesting and what is not the case in Winnipeg, unlike a lot of other places in the league, the jets don't really have any significant money coming off the books going into next season. And we've talked so much about this window, but there is one more year Wheeler on the books, Pierre-Luc Dubois on the books. Um, certainly looking on the blue line, um, two more years of both DeMello and Brendan Dillon. And then that third year of Morrissey, well, Morrissey's beyond that, but Schmidt and Pionk, which if they were entertaining that option, and again, we'll get back to this season in a minute, um, to have him beyond, it probably would predicate a trade of um, a significant player probably up front. And, who knows? The Jets may be forced into that anyways, as we've discussed on numerous occasions. I mean, that's that's possible in in terms of looking forward and trying to turn what we see as a one-year window right now, that two-year window based on 2024 being put Wheeler Hella, but we don't know that, but we're looking at that as a as an important date. And certainly Pierre Luc Dubois, we're you know, probably in advance of that. Um, but if you're looking to extend the window and create a cap situation that works for everybody, well, then, yeah, you kind of do look at money that needs needs to go out. If you're looking at the blue line, you can look in at the results and on the ice this year and say, well, a guy like Dylan Sandberg has been inside the top six of Winnipeg's defensemen all year long. There's the question of whether he can replicate these third pairing results, which are excellent. Absolutely excellent from a shot suppression, keeping scoring chances down perspective. Sandberg has been very, very good. If he can do that in the top four, well, it actually becomes a lot easier to consider moving out one of those veteran left-handed defensemen, perhaps a Brendan Dillon, perhaps a, well, I'm on the right side. I don't think Neil Pionk is necessarily going anywhere, but money is available there. Or if the Winnipeg Jets return to the idea of moving Blake Wheeler, which certainly was not uh, it wasn't a resolution that worked for everybody this most recent summer. There's also a whole lot of cap space available there. I don't think the Jets need to do any of those um, unless Pierre-Luc Dubois is a long-term Jet and they want to add in the short term. But if it's just about fitting a guy like Dubois or a Meyer or other sort of high-impact sort of situation, I think a lot of what Winnipeg needs to do can be accomplished by league minimum contracts in some third, fourth line uh, you know, seven defenseman type situations. All right, Murat, let's get back to your piece um, and talk about the cost to acquire Timo Meyer. And, and like I said, we'll get through. You've got some interesting proposals. It's pretty clear that what the San Jose Sharks at their point, at the point they are as a franchise right now, are looking for a first round pick, I think is automatic from this year's draft, which is, a very valuable asset considering the amount of talent coming into the league in this off season, as well as younger players and prospects. And, you know, the Winnipeg Jets have a number of those. Um, when you were putting together these proposals um, with Curtis, how did you, how did you come about the, uh, the names that were in them? And does one make sense more? Do you think one would be more attracted to the Sharks or more attracted to the Jets than the others? Yeah. The process essentially starts with, Bo Horvat's trade return being used as a floor. And I know that there are those who like Bo Horvat's goal scoring, the fact that he's a center, et cetera. But I think the consensus is that Timo Meyer should have more trade value or about the same. I agree. Um, and, and so that's kind of our, our entry level point. Um, and if you look at the Horvat return, you have a solid prospect, not a superstar level prospect, but a good one, that first round pick. And then Bo Villiers, who's a little bit different than the proposals I put together at, at the athletic for this trade. Um, Bovillia being a little bit more for, far along a um, little bit more dollars to him, but he's a sure for NHL because he is one. And, and I wanted to do something that I saw similar in terms of value. Um, and in this case, using two prospects plus a first round pick in most cases uh, for San Jose. 
I agree with your point earlier when you're talking about, hey, maybe there could be a bidding war situation there. So I didn't want to do, hey, you know, here's Logan Stanley in a second round pick because Corey's plugged in, in in San Jose. We have a market set by the Horvat trade. Like, let's not let's not kid ourselves. It's going to be a dear price. If Winnipeg manages to be that team, that prize Timo Meyer away from the San Jose Sharks, it's going to hurt a little bit. And it's going to start with the first round pick and at least one quality prospect. Um, from there, it sort of becomes about who feels more near and dear to, to you as a Jets fan or, or an analyst? Because I think that there's a tier of prospect, uh, and I'm, I'm leaning heavily on, say, Scott Wheeler's most recent prospect rankings. He has Winnipeg Jets, I think, 13th overall in the NHL. And he has, you know, Rucker McGordy at the absolute top, Chaz Lucius at the absolute top, um, and um, I think Brad Lambert, number three, and Hanel at number four. I think that's the order that he has them in. After that, there's a bit of a cliff in terms of the high impact prospects. And depending on your on your personal views, Hanela might not even be in that elite group. Brad Lambert is boom bust for a lot of people, so he might not even be in that group. If you're gonna blow like a team away in a deal trade wise, you need to stay in that elite group of Winnipeg Jets prospects, or else you're probably not moving the needle with a guy like Timo Meyer. And that makes it painful for Winnipeg. It could be, I don't think it could be prospects that are very near and dear to Winnipeg Jets faithful that will go out in such a deal. And then certainly, you know, a Ville Hainala or, or someone else like that. I, I think the Jets fans have maybe come around to the idea he might not be a forever Jet as well. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, just to, for folks that haven't seen it, you should check out the entire article. It's really interesting and a great read. The first proposal is the first round pick this year, Rucker McGrory and Brad Lambert. The second proposal the 2023 first round pick, Chaz Lucius and Vili Hainala. And the third proposal, the pick, and Logan Stanley and Dylan Sandberg. All, um, you know, similar, although somewhat different. Um, I will say this, and this is just a personal opinion, and maybe it's because we've been so charmed by him when he's come on with the show with us and seen what he's done. Like, to me, the guy that I would be loathe to trade is Rucker McGrory because I just think that he is everything that they wanted in a player, both on the ice and his mental makeup. I mean, you can see the guy's been a captain everywhere. I don't think it's a stretch to think that he could turn into that sort of a player here in Winnipeg. That being said, you got to, uh, scared money don't make money, as they say. They're going <laughs> to have to go for it. Chaz Lucius is coming off a great World Junior Championship, uh, and I think the offensive upside to his game might be even exceeding what McGroarty is. I do wonder, though, what the news of him being out again for the rest of the season after a great start to his Western Hockey League term over there in Portland does to the value of that piece when it comes to trading him and whether they would potentially have to pivot to McGrody just because the asset that is Chaz Lucius might be diminished in a lot of people's eyes because of the fact that he has had so many issues staying on the ice. Yeah, what an unfortunate situation for Lucius. He, you know, a bronze medal winning hat trick for Team USA, yeah. uh, goes to the Western League, joins a contending team, you know, Portland being one of the few teams thought to be able to go deep. And there's a few of them at the top, including Seattle and, of course, including Winnipeg. Let's let's respect that. Um, but that was a very good team. And then he rattles off 16 points in five games. This is meant to be prime developmental time for 19-year-old Chaz Lucius. And then now he has season-ending shoulder surgery. So that, no way around it. That sucks. That sucks for the guy and for, you know, folks cheering for him. I think that would take a little bit of uh, shine off of his value as a trade asset. I, I think so, especially given the fact that he's had lower body injuries ending in previous seasons. Um, I think that there's a little bit of concern there. I also think um, there may be some concern for some teams, and maybe Winnipeg might be one among them. Is this player, just like, say, a Cole Perfetti, can we see him as a center going forward or is he going to be jettisoned to wing uh, in the same way that I think is happening with Perfetti and probably will happen for at least a few years that may impact his value to a certain degree, which makes people perhaps turn to Rucker McGroarty and the Winnipeg Jets. They weren't just pleased to take McGroarty where they did. They were thrilled. They were absolutely thrilled. Um, a leader of leaders, a captain of captains on so many different levels you know, I think that they pulled him off the board a little bit earlier than when a lot of analytics or, you know, pre-rankings would say. 
but it's because of just what you said of how unique of a person he is this idea that like this may be you know an adam lowry of the future but this sort of person that literally everybody respects and, and all of that sort of stuff there's a reason why winnipeg took him where they did and I mean, that's the kind of dear price that I think you have to get into if you're talking about a, a Timo Meyer type player. It might be what pushes the Jets out of that conversation. I know Shovel Dayoff was watching the Tampa San Jose game the other night. Now that just could be because he was at the All Star area GM meetings, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I also want to sort of talk about the sort of cautionary tale that might be Jack Roslovic in this situation where a few years ago he was the unmovable, the untouchable. Teams were asking about him when Winnipeg was looking to upgrade, and that was a player that you just couldn't get enough value for if you were the Winnipeg Jets. First-round pick, tearing it up for the Moose, making the NHL, all of that sort of stuff. Fast forward a couple of years, Roslovic hasn't caught on in the top six in Winnipeg. He's almost, I don't want to say pouting, but there was a sullen state uh, uh, about him in, in the Winnipeg Jets room. And then he essentially becomes... Not quite a throw-in for that uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois trade return, but certainly not the value he had had just a couple of years before. And I know the Jets will have players like McGroarty that they just can't bear the thought of moving, especially for a player like Meyer, who you have for at least one year, maybe two, maybe an extension. All of those are maybes beyond that one year for sure. Um, but there is the cautionary tale of what about the rest after a McGroarty how, can you get too attached to these players? And I think Winnipeg has in the past. Um, is Cole Perfetti untouchable when we're talking about bringing in a massive, massive piece to make a big run this year and potentially next? I think he is for the Winnipeg perspective. And the reason I think that he is, is not just because he was a high pick, not just because he's made the NHL thus far and has put up a, you know, a strong not top three necessarily, but top five, perhaps top six Calder trophy case. It's term. It's the fact that with a player like Cole Perfetti, you have him integrated into the NHL lineup already. He's making, um, he's making an impact in sort of a secondary scoring way. And you can project into the future, knowing that you have him locked up under team control. He's not a maybe like a Brad Lambert. Hey, is he going to become an NHL player? He's a certainty. Um, and He's, uh, like I say, he's a player who's under team control for a lot of years. And I think that given some uncertainty around other important players in Winnipeg, uh, that's just, that might be a, a price a bit too dear for the Jets to give up on, is my read of it. So of those three, you know, proposals that are put together, which one would be the best from a Jets perspective, do you think? And which one, if you're um, Mike Greer in San Jose, is the most attractive from a Sharks perspective. Yeah, at this point, you know, I tried to include a maybe in each. Uh, in each, So Brad Lambert, perhaps in the first proposal with Rutger McGroarty in the, in the first round pick, I see Lambert as a potentially very impactful player, but also a guy who runs the risk of having a little bit too much tunnel vision and not necessarily making the most out of his skill set um, at, at the pro level. Um, and I think that some folks may be dazzled by his skill. You know what I might say is that second proposal with Ville Hainala um, as, a, as a part of it with Chaz Lucius and the, and the first round pick. I think that Hainala's shine is a little bit off. The idea that he might become, hey, he could be a number two defenseman alongside a, a really excellent player. I don't think people necessarily believe that. It's really about whether he can become, whether he's a third pairing NHL or a second pairing at this stage. And I think that that may take some shine off of him. And then with Chaz Lucia's injury situation as well, you might think, well, hey, if there's somebody that we can part with, if the, we're the Winnipeg Jets, it would be a player like that who not only replicates some of the skill sets that our, our other scorers have on the wing, but um, has this injury situation as well. Um, but they're all dear prices. They're all painful prices, and they're all good players, including uh, the Logan Stanley, Dylan Sandberg version, which I included because they're NHL players right now at this stage of their career if the Sharks are leaning more towards players who can step into the lineup very soon. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, there's the potential of a combination of those. I mean, maybe the player that they're most attractive to is, that's currently in the lineup is a Dylan Sandberg. Maybe it's Logan Stanley. We know that there'll be very differing opinions of what he brings to the table. And then as far as the prospects go, um, 
I would love to see it happen. As they say, the one guy that I would be loath to trade would be McGrory. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of personality involved in that. And I just think about the way that he could be such a great fit here. And considering what's happened with this team in the past, that is a guy. I mean, character does matter. And the character that he's brought to every team that he's played, I think, is something that could help this franchise in a number of different ways. So um, if you could make that happen without giving up McGrory, I think it would be a huge win. That being said, I still do think that this could really become somewhat of an arms race and a real bidding war for Meyer because of what we're hearing from a number of teams around the league. If Meyer doesn't get done, what's the next best option in your mind for Kevin Day up at the deadline? Yeah, there's a possibility that Meyer not getting done is one of the best things that happens to Winnipeg because mm. of just the list of guys that we just talked about. Dylan Sandberg, already an impact defensive defenseman at the NHL. McGroarty could be somebody who stabilizes the next window for the Winnipeg Jazz. All of those things that we just talked about. Um, if you're pivoting from those players... I mean, there's some nice poetry in should the St. Louis Blue to the point where they're willing to move on from a player like Ryan O'Reilly, who's an unrestricted free agent this summer. I mean, that mirrors the Paul Stastny situation that was such a nice fit once upon a time. Um, it also gives Winnipeg a player that when he's on is as close to a perfect 200-foot player as you can get in the NHL. He hasn't had that season in St. Louis. I don't think this has been that year for him there. And that's a little bit of a buyer beware for Ryan O'Reilly is what level can he get to? But when he's on, he would be a better face-off man than Dubois or Shifley. He'd be just behind either one in terms of scoring capabilities. He can move to the wing or force one of Winnipeg's existing centers to the wing. He can take a second unit power play job away from a guy like Adam Lowry who's not going to be lighting it up on that second unit. There's a lot to like. He's also closer to his prime than, say, a Jonathan Taves, whose name we always hear for the obvious reasons, um, in terms of being more likely to have a major impact in, in, in the playoffs as well. And you can also point to the fact that he's a cup winner. Same with Taves. He's sort of like a light version of all of those things, plus all of the intensity that, that I guess I gather that he brings. Those are the types of players that I like for Winnipeg. Somebody who can force, who can expand that top six unit so much so that if Cole Perfetti is struggling one night with playoff intensity, he can go down the lineup. If Blake Wheeler's speed isn't there for him on one night, and he's not slow, certainly, but we just remember what he was. If you need to move a veteran down to, say, Adam Lowry's line as a tough minutes ready group, well, then this other top six player that you brought in is insulation there, too. I think that's it gives Winnipeg the most additional options if you can pl pry players like those away. Um, the blue line is also an area that I think the Jets would love to bring in an impact player. And Jacob Chikrin continues to be the number one guy on pretty much everybody's list. It is interesting that they've apparently had him available for a while and this deal still hasn't got done. Um, what do you think the cost would be to get Jacob Chikrin? Would the Winnipeg Jets be willing to pay that if um, if it came down to that? Yeah, I think it will be similarly dear to almost these Meyer trade proposals that we're talking about where, you know, in Chikrin's case, he's got a few years left on his deal yet, and it's an affordable deal. Yeah, two more yeah. with 4.6, like two more seasons after this at 4.6 million. I mean, very, very affordable. But that goes for any team in the league. Probably makes his value that much more attractive to uh, a number of suitors. Yeah, whereas with Meyer, you're looking at that 10 million qualifying offer, and you're like, well... Just about nobody can squeeze that in. Winnipeg might be able to. In the case of Chikra, now everybody can. And if they can't, they'd be willing to get rid of whatever player they needed to to make him work. And I think that that's a situation that has served Arizona well. I mean, they've basically torn the the, the foundation right down to the studs in, in, in Arizona. And that's clear for everybody to see. But this is their one last piece, who if they're going to trade him, it's going to be for something as close to their terms as possible because of the price point and all of that sort of thing. So again, I'm looking at a first round pick and in these situations, maybe more than one high end prospect to, to help backfill for the coyotes. I'd imagine that defense would be a premium for them as well. So maybe that means a Dylan Sandberg, maybe that means a Hanela or a Chisholm or what have you um, alongside yet another top end prospect. And it might be the sort of deal depending on how much creativity Shovel Day Off is willing to go through, 
that would a Chickman deal would help Winnipeg's foundation for the next several years for the, this and two more seasons, um, and then whatever you're able to get done after that. It makes your blue line expensive, and you have to be willing to find a, a suitor for Nate Schmidt, Neil Pionk, Brendan Dillon, Dylan DeMello, one of those players who is making money in substantial form because you can't carry everybody's cap there. And I think it takes a secondary deal um, in the offseason or what have you, I think, to make that work. Um, I wouldn't so, yeah. be surprised if one of those players actually was in an actual deal. I mean, just simply from a money-in, money-out perspective. Not that the Jets absolutely have to have that at this point but to, to your example i mean the minute you get going into next season you've got all this money on the books you're almost forced to do that and i mean if you are making a deal with the arizona coyotes the one thing that they have for days is cap space i mean they're using retired players and guys that aren't even around as getting <laughs> them to that floor so i mean it might mean you have to give up a little bit more to get jacob chikrin but at the same time, I don't think it's out of the question that one of those players might actually be part of the return. So you get the money off the books, although I think the Jets would love to have Chikrin as well as the guys they have right now if they're planning on making a deep playoff run because you need all those guys. I mean, that's a great point. And I was just trying to quickly have a pull up of, you know, cap friendly, puck PD, all of that sort of stuff to how close are the Winnipeg, sorry, are the Arizona Coyotes to that cap floor? And do they fall beneath it if they move a, a Jacob Chickren without taking a certain amount of cap space back? And I hadn't considered that question. It's an important one. I don't know the answer just at this moment as we're talking, but you might be right on that play. I just can't think from an on ice perspective of who um, the Coyotes could possibly want, lest they make too positive of an impact on the ice and keep tanking <laughs> somehow from going. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure where the, the stakeholders are in that decision. Well, that is a great, great point, Murat. Um, listen, this has been an awesome conversation. I am looking forward to a couple more of these before things probably get pretty crazy towards the end of the month. And uh, good thing is we're going to have the team back with a real live practice tomorrow, another one on Friday, and then uh, that late game. And just before we go, a big opportunity for the Winnipeg Jets when you look at this schedule coming up, the first sort of two weeks coming back before they hit the road. Um, right after the deadline, they have maybe the toughest two weeks of their schedule, Florida trip, Carolina, Boston Bruins, Minnesota wild. Um, just your thoughts on uh, what's at stake for the jets right now, coming out of the break to get onto a good start, maybe avoid a result like the Minnesota wild had in Arizona in their first game out of the break. Yeah. I mean, I, I could imagine some clumsiness coming out of the break Two practice days is a big help. I would imagine as well. Um, I think the big thing for Winnipeg right now, in my opinion, is that it's not about the other teams at all. When the Jets fell off their game for those two weeks before the break there, and then Josh Morrissey put them on his back in that third period, I think that was a matter of Winnipeg Jets standards slipping from Winnipeg Jets standards. They pulled together a few wins out of the situation. Their standings points weren't too terribly harmed, but it was a clear step back. And I think that what I'm looking for if I'm Winnipeg Whatever the results are in this next stretch, it's got to be about reestablishing the process, so to speak, and playing the right way and managing the puck at the blue lines and being patient enough to wait for the moment where they can take over the game because they do that when they're playing with confidence and speed and with good puck management that they weren't for a couple of weeks there. So I think that if I'm sizing up the Winnipeg Jets moving ahead, it's thank goodness Morrissey put them on their back. They're good vibes once again. They're rested, which is what they sort of told us that they needed. Let's just get back to playing the way that we need to play. And for me, if they can do that, I don't care how many points they get out of the stretch because they'll be just fine head into the trade deadline and even beyond. Uh, great point. Going to be a fun month as we get closer to uh, the 3rd of March. and It'll be just great to have the boys back on the ice, albeit with that late home game, 9 p.m., to get back at it on Saturday. Marat, thanks as always. All the best. Thanks, Oz. Thank you. Uh, give him a follow on Twitter at WPG Marat and make sure to check out his latest piece uh, along with uh, Curtis Pichelka over in San Jose. Um, what a Timo Meyer trade might look like and potential packages the Winnipeg Jets might send to the San Jose Sharks. Um, great stuff with Marat. Got to give a big shout out and thanks to our friends at Princess Auto. And I, we'll give a good luck to uh, Reed Carruthers. 
of Team Carruthers going into the uh, Viterra Men's Championship. I know Maddie Dunstone's team's number one. We'll hit that more next week. And, of course, the Scotty's coming up as well. Princess Auto, proud sponsor of curling and Manitoba's top curlers, Bombers, Gold Eyes, and Winnipeg Sports Talk as well as Princess Auto is the place to find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Two Winnipeg locations, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, and you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. If you've got needs in the water game, folks, for over 65 years, the family-owned team at Culligan Water have been the go-to folks here in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba, and Culligan has everything when it comes to water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, and citywide water delivery services, all at a great price, as well as commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Pop down and see them in person at 1200 Sargent Avenue. You can give them a call at 204-694-5180 or check them out online with everything they can do for you and your family at drinkculligan.com. And just before we bring in Big Zig for Cassie, a big cheers to our friends at Canadian Club. Of course, the proud sponsor and official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I will admit, I'm thinking more and more about getting back to IG Field to see the Bombers try and get back on top of the CFL, especially after the big announcement broken by Jeff Hamilton that Kenny Lawler is coming back to the Bombers on a two-year deal. In the meantime, before we get to IG Field, you can get the great taste of Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey, Canadian Club, at your local Manitoba Liquor Mart. All right, let's bring in Zig for Cassie. We're counting down to Super Bowl 57 between the Chiefs and the Eagles in Glendale, Arizona on Sunday. Zig, of course, manning the booth at Sirius XM NFL Radio and joins us now. Zig, what is going on? How are you, and are you ready for the big game? Hustler, doing great, my friend. Of course I'm ready. Who isn't ready at this point, right? Well, I'm. listen, it's uh, it seems like... By, by the way, what, uh, what shirt do you have on today, Zig? Look at that, a little old-school 90s Jets logo. How You're about that, huh? Making some big fans oh, in the chat today. <laughs> That uh, is, uh, is phenomenal. Um, well, maybe we'll get a quick uh, hockey take or two from you at the end, but let's focus in on the big game on Sunday. Um, what a matchup. I mean, this is as close of a matchup, I think, in a lot of ways, certainly by the point spread right now, basically one, one and a half. I wouldn't be surprised if it's closer to a pick em by the time we get to Sunday afternoon. Um, what did you think about the way the Eagles and Chiefs booked their ticket to Glendale two Sundays ago? I would say in Philadelphia's part, Hustler, it's uh, business as usual because they were the favorite coming out of the NFC. Uh, they dismantled a, actually a pretty decent Giants team and then uh, definitely took advantage of uh, San Francisco's plight in their quarterback situation, which, again, I think this is going to be something discussed in the offseason where you know, they eliminated that years ago where you could basically dress a third quarterback as an emergency one. And if the other two got hurt, they'd be able to play, but that policy is no longer in. So you felt bad for the Niners that they had to go back to Purdy after what happened uh, in that championship game and what happened now is to uh, Josh Johnson. So uh, it was clear Philadelphia was the best team in the NFC. San Francisco had been on such a great run, but uh, Philadelphia showed they were superior and in the AFC, Kansas City, uh, I thought Jacksonville, they're on the ascend. Ex-Andy Reid assistant Doug Peterson doing a hell of a job there in his first year in uh, Jacksonville. And then you've got uh, the rematch against Cincinnati. And quite honestly, Hustler, when I thought that Burrow got the ball late and they converted that third and I think 15 or whatever it was, I go, here we go. Go cool is going to do this again. But your Chiefs held, and then obviously they got the ball back. Mahomes got – they were aided by that uh, unnecessary penalty against Osai, which I feel bad for the kid because they actually had a hell of a game that day for Cincinnati, but that 15 yards gave uh, Butker the chance to win the game. So maybe in Kansas City's case, it wasn't as dominant. But, hey, they're at the finish line too, just like Philadelphia is. 
Well, I mean, it wasn't as dominant. I mean, I think there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, you had Mahomes doing it on a, a bum leg. And then, yeah. Zig, I mean, what was so yes. incredible about that second half when they did? I mean, the play, the p- touchdown pass he had to MVS. And the yeah. fact that, I mean, Juju Smith-Schuster out, Mikko Hardman out, Kadarius Tony out. And they were bringing special teamers on and catching yeah. passes in that game. Um a huge, huge benefit, I would suggest, for the Kansas City Chiefs to have this bye week. Certainly for the Eagles, too. There's been some questions about Jalen Hurts' health overall. He hasn't needed to be great because of the way they have bulldozed the Niners and the Giants to get to this point. But holy smokes. I mean, the, and listen, we talk about the offensive players. One of the other huge injuries in that game was Legereus Sneed who's yes. turned into one of the best tackling corners in the entire National Football League. He was knocked out and put in concussion protocol three plays into the game. Yep. Another rookie came in there. And, I mean, to get those guys back, I-, I would say that the Chiefs will have at least an opportunity of being closer to the team that they are at full capacity based on an extra week of rest going into Sunday's game. Yeah, I-, I would agree with you. Al- although with high ankle sprains, Hustler, it's still a dicey go, and if I'm Jonathan Gannon, the Eagles' defensive coordinator, I'd come with the blitz early, be where Patrick's ankle is, and if it is like when he ultimately was hobbled against the Bengals, that's where a little trouble could set in. But if he's you know even close to Patrick being Patrick, you know the first 15 plays as we all know with Andy Reader scripted, then if he gets that ball out quick, then he's good to go. Um, how impressed have you been with the Eagles? Uh, like outside of the quarterback position, I think you can make an argument that in just about every positional area, it's at minimum a push, if not an advantage on the Philadelphia side of things. I mean, for folks that maybe haven't seen a lot of the Eagles this year, just how deep and well-rounded is this football team that's representing the NFC? Well, you already had, you know, some good guys already in place. The Lane Johnsons of the world, Jason Kelsey, Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, um, Gainwell. So they have a very good backfield. Goddard, one of the better young tight ends in the game. But then you add the likes of A.J. Brown, and you got to give Howie Roseman a ton of credit. This guy is not afraid to make the big moves. Defensively, Graham's a stalwart. He's been there for a lot of years. But then you also look at the fact that, you know, they're they're not afraid to make the big trades. Remember, they brought Indomitian Sue later in this season. Uh, Darius Slay was added this, uh, this past year from Detroit. So they're not afraid to make the big moves. They are deep. They are talented everywhere. And I think you're right there. Maybe from a veteran and a little bit more experienced standpoint, I think they stand a little better chance at that point than the Chiefs do. Although Kansas City's assimilated a lot of younger guys into their lineup. Well, and you know what? That's what you have to do when you got a all-star quarterback on his second, uh, on uh, on a outside of his rookie deal. Um, it makes you, you know, try to find affordable players, and that was part of the genius of the Tyreek Hill trade. Although, Zig, I don't think many people thought that this would come together maybe as quickly as it has for Andy Reid and the Chiefs after moving on from uh, from him and having so many players they just picked in last year's draft that are contributing right now. From a defensive perspective, the one thing that stands out about the Eagles that is not great for the NFC side of things, Zig, is that they haven't been great against the run this season. Their secondary is absolutely elite. Their linebacker is strong. But they're in the bottom third of the league when it comes to defending the run. That being said, the Chiefs have had almost no success running the football through two games so far in the playoffs. What do you make of the matchup of the Chiefs running game against the Eagles' ability to stop it? Well, I think you got to try to run the ball. You know, that's something that they're going to have to do. Uh, And Pacheco, when he's been able to be unleashed here, he, he's been a beast. Seventh round pick out of uh, Rutgers this past year. And now with Hardman going on IR and Clyde Edwards-Alaire returning, this helps. So I think in Kansas City's case, it definitely has to be able to run the ball, keep the balance. Because you don't want, I don't know if you want Patrick throwing the ball 45, 50 times here, Hustler. So I think it's one of those things where they're going to try even if they can't, you've got to be able to try to establish the run 
uh, against that very good Philadelphia defense. Uh, Zig, there's so many incredible storylines. First off, we've got the two best teams in the league, the number one seed on the AFC, the number one seed on the NFC going at it. The coaching matchup is delicious, though. I mean, Andy Reid, with all of his history in Philly, going up against his old team, what a lot of people don't know is that Nick Sirianni was on the Chiefs coaching staff when Andy Reid took over. That's and, right. Um, was uh, sent packing with a number of other guys. When you look at this coaching matchup, we know the established brilliance of Reed, although some of his shortcomings, and I mean, I think you learned some things the hard way, which he has, and the relative inexperience of Nick Sirianni. How um, do you give a, a, a big advantage on either side? Uh, and how impactful do you think that will be in a game that many people think is going to be very, very close? Oh, I think experience counts for something. I mean, this is Andy Reid's, yeah, back to his days in Philadelphia. This is, what, his fourth time. And Sirianni, who's done a terrific job, by the way. And by my, by the way, my co-host, Todd Haley, the former Chiefs head coach, will remind everyone that he gave him his first coaching gig in the NFL uh, when he got hired on. Uh, so uh, I always got to throw that in. But, um, yeah, I think it counts for something. Obviously, Reed's been there, done that. You know, Sirianni, this is the biggest game he's coaching in his life. Does he just approach it like almost like a rookie? Like, hey, we made it here. Uh, does he defer to his de assistants? So I, I would say it counts for something. And, and I got to think here, Andy's got to be motivated because, you know, for all the good that he did in Philadelphia, uh, towards the end, it got kind of kind of ugly. And people wanted him out. And he probably never forgot the way that he was treated towards the end. I'm sure he's made peace with management there in Philadelphia, but I'm sure he always keeps that. Just like Suriani said, he keeps kind of the Reed slight in his mind. I think Andy may keep the Eagles letting him go slight in his mind. So that's going to be some great theater. And then one other part of the story that we can't miss is, um, I mean, the Kelsey brothers. And it's just yeah. amazing, Zig, when you think about these two, they're both already Super Bowl champions. They're both amongst the best at their position in the entire league. And they're going up against each other for the ultimate bragging rights in uh. the family forever and ever. Um, just thoughts on those two players, though, and how important they are to their respective teams uh, going into the game. Oh, Travis, I think, you know, many said Gronk was the best tight end of the game. I think he was. Uh, I think maybe Kelsey picks up that medal because I think he's an underrated blocker. And people know, Andrew, he's getting the ball, yet they can't stop him. You know, he let's not forget AFC Championship game. There was talk he might not even play because his back was so yeah. bad. Well, he made Cincinnati ill with all the catches that he was making. So that tells you about him. And then with Jason, you know, the heart, the soul, the guts, the embodiment of what tough Philadelphia is. And it's a tremendous storyline. You've seen his mother, Donna, on all these different shows. So uh, they're a credit to football because not only are they great players, they're great leaders, great role models. And I think each team is lucky to have them. No, great stuff. Uh, you got a lean right now. I don't know if you've made an official pick yet, but uh, what do you expect on Sunday? Being a Cowboys fan, I can't root for Philadelphia. <laughs> Come I'll on say, board with the Chiefs, Zig. Uh, all right, I'll say this. My heart says the Chiefs, but my head says the Eagles. Well, hopefully your uh, heart will prevail over you your go. head like uh, many others. Uh, hey, just quickly before we go, you're very close to this Boston Bruins hockey team. They have been just absolutely phenomenal so far this year can they keep it up and um what's it going to take to beat the boston bruins in a best of seven come playoff time that's those are a couple of really good questions i think for them i'm not sure they're really trying to worry about keeping it up as i pose to probably not getting guys hurt this might be the time of the year uh jim montgomery who's done a phenomenal job in his first year and if guys like Bergeron or Krejci don't like it, it's, hey, it's too bad. We may sit you a game or two to preserve you. Uh, if they do make a trade at the deadline, which I presume Donnie Sweeney is going to try to do, then you got to assimilate those guys into the lineup. And I think just in terms of beating them in a series, 
Uh, they've been more aggressive from the defensive end towards the offense. If you start, you know, doing layups on them and exposing that, that might be a possibility of how you try to beat them. Uh, you want to try to make your third or fourth lines try to beat them because I think their top two lines are as good as it gets. So um, they're going to need to have uh, more balance from their third and fourth lines. And, and you hope that Allmark uh, doesn't, uh, you know, fall out of his Cinderella slipper at midnight. So, uh, but they look very, very good at this point. Far better. I, I figured, uh, Andrew, they're going to be a playoff team solidly but not like this. I mean, this is almost historic, but you know what? Here's my number, 16. You could have 160 points for all I care, but if you don't win those 16 games to raise Lord Stanley's Cup, then maybe it's all for nothing. Well, and you know, in that division, I mean, with the NHL playoff format the way it is right now, with the Bruins assuming they win the first round, playing the winner of the likely Toronto-Tampa series, I mean, that is going to be one of the series, certainly, of the playoffs. Zig, thank you so much for doing this. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the big game, and uh, we'll have to talk a little puck a little bit more as we get closer to the playoffs later on uh, in the next month or so. Also, always great being with you, my friend. Thank you for having me. Take it easy. The one and only Zig Fricassi. Check him out on Sirius XM NFL Radio. All right, we've got some more to get to before we're done. First off, big thanks to the Nick and Nicky DQ team for their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Four locations in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba, DQ Northgate, DQ Niverville, DQ Polar Park, and DQ St. Anne's. Pop by for some great eats and cool treats. And of course, if you're looking for a uh, ice cream cake or one of those amazing blizzard cakes for an upcoming party or event, you can hit them up on Instagram as well, at DQ Manitoba. Let them know what you're looking for. They'll custom make it for you for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. And gang, while you're getting ready for your Super Bowl spread, don't forget the good stuff. If you're serving beers, why not make it Winnipeg's favorite local beer, Little Brown Jug. Go with the uh, tried and true flagship brand, the 1919, or mix it up. And try the great new Little Brown Jug offerings in the Good Times Variety Pack. You can pick that up at Little Brown Jug at Manitoba Liquor Marts or anywhere that sells good beer. And if you want to get ahead of the game right now, get online to littlebrownjug.ca. Pick out everything you want and they'll deliver it to you citywide again at littlebrownjug.ca. All right. Busy, busy show. Great to see everyone with us. By the way, if you haven't already, hit that red subscribe button and make sure you're joining us Monday to Friday, live, 1 o'clock on YouTube. Let's get Remus back in here before we get to the cool bet lines. And, uh, man, a lot of hockey talk. Obviously, we led off today talking about the big, big story with Kenny Lawler returning to the Bombers. And I know the CFL is going to be all over the news on WST next week with free agency. Nice to get a little more Super Bowl content as we get closer to uh, closer to Sunday as well. But obviously, great stuff with Wish and uh, Murat Tesh today on the program, talking Jets as well as everything else in the league. Yeah, lots to get to. We had the Kenny Lawler talk off the start of the show. Uh, so go back if you missed it. I saw Winnipeg Walter saying, did he miss it? And, and uh, we had a lot of hockey talk. Trade deadline, March 3, less than a month away. We we're counting down. Uh, great chat with you and Murat talking about who would the Jets give up in a potential trade. You know, we've gone through all the trade bait lists, you know, as they come out, and we'll keep discussing that. And yes, yeah, Super Bowl as well. So there is a big game, the big game on Sunday. So a lot of topics. We didn't even touch on. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll get to it here, but uh, last night's uh, historic. Well, event we in the NBA. just on that, I wanted to get your take on this uh, because we were talking about some interesting potential packages that the Winnipeg Jets might offer for Timo Meyer from the San Jose Sharks. Did you have the same reaction to me when you saw Rucker McGordy's name involved in one of those? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, like you have this attachment to all these prospects, but I mean, you're going with a proven commodity here in Timo Meyer, so you're going to have to give something up. Uh, Julian had a nice comment in chat that says, look, you know, you're kind of, they're kind of similar players. So you're basically just speeding up Rutgers development by trading him for Timo Meyer, which I kind of agreed with. Um, I mean, his guy who would certainly have value teams that would, you know, you don't want to give this guy up, but Hey, you're going, you need to win now and you're trading 
a very unproven commodity and your first round pick from this past summer to a player who's point per game right now in the NHL. So, I mean, you know, long term, could it hurt you? Possibly, but I mean, that's why you make these trades and you're trying to win right now. And if it gets you over the hump now, you got to make that trade. Yeah. Again, this is completely, I will admit to a case of wanting to have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. Um, but listen, I would love for them to make a big, big push to get Timo Meyer. But if I'm Kevin Sheveldayoff, I would do everything I could to not include Rucker McGrory because I think he is not only an exciting player in the short term when he gets to the National Hockey League, but a guy that could be uh, a mainstay and a huge part of this franchise for a long, long time. And I listen, this is not a knock on any of the other guys that we mentioned. Um, but to me, the package that he brings is just a little different than most of the other guys with that upside. And obviously, the injury to Chaz Lucius, I think, complicates things in some ways. Just with his injury history overall, might diminish that asset. Uh, but certainly the season that he had when he has been playing has certainly been uh, been great overall. But listen, let's get to last night. Uh, LeBron James sets the record for all-time NBA regular season points passing Kareem. It was quite the spectacle. And let's get to the why not question of the day right now in the chat. Very simply, who is the GOAT when it comes to the NBA? Is it LeBron James or is it Michael Jordan? Put your answer in the chat. I'd like to see your comments on that. Uh, what did you think about last night, Remo? It really was quite the spectacle. Lost in it all was the Lakers losing at home to the very poor Oklahoma City Thunder. Well, there was actually a game. Like, I was thought it was just there the was. Le- LeBron show. I turned it off after the third. I was like, okay, I've seen enough here. Uh, I thought the broadcast was awesome. I loved how TNT had the tracker, um, with the tracker with the how many points he needed, so you always knew. You know, you know, even when he didn't get it before the half, uh, you know, their intermission show was always solid. Um, you know, what a performance by LeBron James, 38 years old. And still put up points. He's not playing every night, but um, you know it was a very historic event. And the, you know he, they did um, what stopped the game after he broke the record uh, for points, and uh, it was an awesome ceremony. Great call as well on the basket. I mean, a beautiful fadeaway jumper that he's done. You know, signature move for LeBron. So um, yeah, it was, it was that was history. Huss and. Um, you kind of reflect a lot. I saw you had a tweet. You know, it's been amazing, you know, how many great players we've been able to watch in the last, you know, 35 years. You mentioned Jordan, LeBron. You know, I just keep thinking it's been the week of hearing about uh, Tom Brady retiring. He's been around for 20 years. Uh, Sid and Ovi skating yeah. together, highlight of the All-Star game. I mean, these guys are all, you know, some of the greatest of all time. And there's LeBron on top of the points list. And it almost makes you feel old because you remember – uh, when he was drafted and how much hype there was coming out of high school, and like I don't think, I don't think this is going to be passed because guys have to they can't come out in out of high school anymore and yeah. be that good. So. Well, and and here's the other thing, um, you know he's still doing it. He's 38 years old and he is doing it amongst the best in. But it's funny, I look in the chat, it's like all jar, all it's mostly Michael Jordan. And then you see things like LaCry Baby James. Like, there's a lot of haters. Like, Le- LeBron James has so many haters. And I was talking about it with Dusty on the on the lock shop today. And Dusty is, like, the biggest LeBron guy I've ever met. He's got, like, a LeBron shrine in his place. So you can take this for what it's worth. But I honestly believe, Remo, that the infamous decision was maybe the worst PR gaffe in... It's right there with the biggest PR gaps in sports history. And I really think a lot of the hate that LeBron gets is still blowback from that ridiculous ordeal um, of when he left Cleveland, where he's from, and went to Miami. And, And I think he's been trying to make good for that really the rest of his career. And that was a big part of him going back to Cleveland to win that championship afterwards and do what he said he would do at the start. I have to think that if he just quietly went about leaving, coming back, doing his thing, as opposed to that decision, I think a lot of his haters would probably be far more open to the idea that 
he may retire with the best career of all time? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of the hate came from the decision. I mean, to have this big TV special. I mean, it was the TV version of Shawn Michaels uh, kicking Marty Jannetty through the, <laughs> through the glass window. Marty Jannetty was the entire city of Cleveland in yeah. the state of Ohio. I mean, to have that special, you know, try to shield, shield it with Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And I remember, I think I was at Folk Fest when it happened. It was just so, un, you know, got the alert on my phone. Might have been a, a BlackBerry. But, uh, I mean, it was just unbelievable that he would do that to the city that he's from. And just in that fashion. So I agree. I think he, he, there was a lot of people who hated Miami. I know I cheered against them for sure. But oh, you can't was, they were the team you'd love to hate. I mean, yeah. with Bosch and, and uh, you know, that was kind of the start of the super team in a lot of ways. And, yes. Um, but the thing about it was, and again, I'm a fan of LeBron's, but I think that the lack of self-awareness of what that was going to do to those people. Um, and listen, he probably had a whole bunch of yes men around him, as most stars do. He got terrible advice, and I think it really harmed him from a PR perspective. And that's the reason why there's still so many people that are LeBron haters um, and will still stump for Jordan, um, despite many of the things that he was known to have done off the court. And the fact that he had to leave in very strange circumstances to be a baseball player for a while and then came back and no one remembers what he was doing at the end with the Wizards. But I can tell you, it's nothing close to what LeBron's doing right now, still as one of the top players in the league. Yeah, showed it to T. Will, who says in chat, everything comes back to Marty, Janetti, and Shawn Michaels, and Nintendo ice hockey, everything. <laughs> and I think that's entirely accurate, everything. Uh, the barbershop is a great metaphor for many things, says Chris Vermette. So shout out to you guys. Um, but, I mean, LeBron, I mean, he dragged some of these terrible Cleveland teams uh, to the finals. Or remember, they had, like, Matthew Delvadova, who Daniel Gibson... Uh, Anderson Vergeau, Della Jova, J.R. Smith. That's right. <laughs> I mean, how many consecutive? I mean, people are like, well, how many championships? How many consecutive finals did he go to just with these junk teams? No, well, I mean, and no let's offense. face it, yeah. that I mean, the the comeback of down three one against the Golden State Warriors mm -hmm. is still going to be seen as one of the great comebacks in all of sports history. And I mean, listen, it burnt them so bad they had to go and get KD. Um, to, uh, to 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 beat them at the end. So, um, anyways, it, it's it's a really interesting. It's a like, fun debate. I don't want to turn this into a summer episode of first take when they don't have anything to talk about and they just basically go, "Who's better, MJ versus LeBron?" Um, but respect where it's deserved, and um, he's the king of the hill, passing the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar last night with uh, thirty-six and three quarters. It was amazing having uh, Kareem there courtside. Um, you know, passing the ball to LeBron after, and then LeBron, but they took a picture, which is pretty pretty cool. I mean, a very historic thing. Uh, Adam Silver there. LeBron gave a speech. I loved the end to LeBron's speech. Maybe the greatest end to a speech ever, where he just said "fuck guys, thanks." <laughs> like know, that's how yeah. he ended it. And then I started thinking of the greatest what about athlete, the kids, LeBron. Well, I mean, I mean, what can you say? Like, I think he looked really overcome. With yeah. emotion, like this was a record that has been around for what thirty eight years. Like was was set the year LeBron was born, and to be the top scorer in NBA history, I mean, I think he was very overwhelmed. That's a credible accomplishment. Like there's just so much expectations on him when he was drafted, and he's fulfilled all of them. I mean, he's never been in any off court trouble. The worst PR thing you said was the decision. Um, I mean, it was just an incredible. Event and I did sorry I got to point this out I did think of like best athlete speech f bombs and I think that was up there I mean what an event also David Chase Ortiz Utley. Chase David Utley at <laughs> saying this is our effing city for the Boston yeah. and uh, Dustin Brown at the Cup where he's like look at this effing team and I don't want to start throwing f bombs all, <laughs> all over the show but uh, I think that I mean that was just such a such a way to end end the speech like oh yeah and his kids were there. Also, the hot takes are flying, Hess. There's a famous picture now of the shot, and everyone behind, like, pretty much everyone except for the, like, the president of Nike, has their phone out taking a picture, and everyone's you know, dumping all over the guys with, watching it through their phone. I mean, honestly, I'm not, not really a phone. I mean, you can get, get it on TV. Like, you don't maybe take a picture. Like, I'm not really a big phone 
guy if, anymore. If I, if I was at that, I'm willing to admit, if I was at that game and yeah. it was the big moment and I paid whatever to be there, I would probably be making sure that I had that moment from my perspective on it. And I don't understand in 2023 all these hardos say, Live in the now. Respect the game. Put your phone down. Do what I mean. Nobody had welcomes. phones out in 96 for Jordan, <laughs> us. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Anyways, that was um, that was something else. And uh, lost it at all. The Lakers stink. They lost to OKC. It's a one-man show there. And okay. maybe most interesting, Reem. By, by the way, a lot of support for Michael Remus being the GOAT. Um, shout out to everyone in chat backing uh, backing Remo in this. Uh, I guess it's what? a three-way uh, three debate right now. About um, what's the debate? The thing, no, just you know, we were talking about the goat, LeBron, MJ, and there's a lot of people backing you. Is in fact the did I say LeBron? Time, did so. I say Jordan? I didn't say Jordan. Did I? Did I weigh no. in? No, I'm just saying. Apparently, people are adding. You're you're like a write-in oh. candidate. Oh, uh, for no, I'm not, for this. So on. you're you're getting a lot of love from. People Sorry, in the chat. I thought you meant they were like backing my opinion. But, They're actually backing no. me <laughs> as the as the goat. No, um, but the one thing that stood out is that bumass Anthony Davis was basically sitting down on the bench as all of this happened, seemingly not interested at all in uh, in what was going on. And I, listen, I think that that team, you know, between Westbrook and LeBron might be the greatest player of all time. He certainly isn't the best GM of all time because a lot of the guys that I think he has worked hard to surround him has um has really blown up and uh well it was a perfect example of it last night that being said had to mention that today all right let's quickly get to the cool bet lines only two games tonight in the national hockey league we'll get to that in a minute but as it has been for pretty much the last four days um we don't have any movement on the super bowl line one and a half points the eagles are the favorite the money line chiefs plus 104 and the Eagles minus 122 total is back up to 51. NHL tonight, two games. Canucks Rangers. Rangers a minus 231 money line favorite. And the Minnesota Wild taking on the Dallas Stars. I'm actually taking the Wild tonight to bounce back from that ugly regulation loss coming out of the break against the Coyotes. And I'm uh, going to parlay that with the Rangers puck line at minus one and a half. And one thing, golf fans, this Waste Management Open, Dusty and I hit it in the lock shop with all of our picks. They've got some great exclusives in the Cool Bet exclusive section for the Waste Management Phoenix Open. And check out today's lock shop if you want to get some of our selections before they tee off tomorrow heading into the big game on Sunday. I mean, it feels like a major. It's got a major feel to it. Going to be a great, great tourney with the uh, PGA Tour this week. If you haven't played at Cool Bet before, use the promo code WST on your first deposit. Hook you up with a 100% bonus on your first deposit, up to 200 bucks, just in time for the Super Bowl and everything else that um, you might want to put a little sprinkle on. Um, and Remo, I guess tomorrow we'll spend a little bit more time focusing in on some of the names, not Timo Meyer, that the Jets have been connected to. And uh, I guess Scout Watch will continue. We'll find out whether Chevy was attending other NHL games tonight and tomorrow as we continue our finger on the pulse and find out what's going to happen as we get closer to the 3rd of March. Yeah, I love when anyone who's in a press box looks at the list and then just says, okay, we got scouts here from 19 teams checking this out. Like, oh, and it just fuels all the speculation. So I love... You know, I'll I'll retweet any tweet that says a Jet scout or executive was at a game. Like, oh, what could that mean? Are the Jets gonna get Timo Meyer? I don't know. I I mean, I have no idea. But uh, it is it, it's definitely interesting that you know, that's where Kevin Chevaldeoff was. You know, usually it would be a scout. I don't really hear about Chevy, but maybe he was vacationing in Florida for the All Star game. And hey, they were in Tampa. Like, oh, sure, I'll get some work in. I'm or not sure that it's you don't a, think it's a coincidence? coincidence that it was the San Jose <laughs> game. Just just saying right now. Certainly, hey, it's fun for us to speculate on. Gang, we got to run. Got to get some stuff cooking for tomorrow's show this afternoon. Um, thanks again to a great selection of guests and awesome work to uh, Remo for killing it today. Greg Wyshynski, Murata Tesh, and our man Zig Fricassi. 
We'll uh, get ready for the Super Bowl tomorrow with Brandon Rowicki. Talk more about the NHL trade market. And uh, looking forward to having Nolan Baumgartner come on the program as well. Have that coming up likely tomorrow on the show. Thanks again to all the sponsors that uh, support Winnipeg Sports Talk and make this show happen every day. And most of all, thanks to you for making us a part of yours. Have a great one tonight. Get outside, enjoy this beautiful weather, and make sure you're back with us 22 hours from now, 1 p.m. tomorrow, live on YouTube here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Have a great night. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com. 